Hello folks, welcome back to the channel. Uh, the dude's head went down to the bottom so that now you can uh, see me down there instead of up there. Um, just wanted to change a little bit things up so that uh, we don't let get too bored. I also uh, put my chair a little bit further down so that you can see now the top of my head, the whole beauty together. And um, I'm going to show you a book. A book that is a remarkably good one. I really enjoyed going through this. It is a book about an opening and in general I am uh, a bit reluctant to offer opening books. I don't really like the concept of opening books because my theory on this is that opening theory is improving and developing at a rapid pace and by the time it uh, hits the bookstores you feel like oh there have been three more novelties that uh, I should have Im involved in the book. But that's not to say that uh, we shouldn't buy opening books, it's just that we need to be very careful with where we buy it or rather which authors we trust when we buy opening books. One that I really did enjoy lately was uh, a combined effort of uh, Hungarian Grandmaster Imre Hera and his Turkish friend Ufuk uh, Tünser or Tanker or Tünker, I don't know how to pronounce the dude's name. They wrote a book about the uh, Queen's uh, Indian defense and even in that they were only focused on a very popular and topical variation which I'm playing out on the board which is called the Queen's Indian Gambit this pawn sacrifice with d5 a super fun opening really really cool stuff I very highly recommend uh, white players to play like this uh, requires a fairly sound knowledge of theory as well as a good understanding of chess and what's going on in chess openings and middle games if you are late rated below 2000 fide you can give it a go by all means but uh, I think that uh, it requires a bit of chess maturity to play a variation like this so I totally randomly picked a line which is not even a game from this book to show you a how cool this variation is but more importantly too what a thorough and very deep analysis these two guys have put together um, so definitely you can see that there is a lot of effort in the book you can definitely see that uh, they didn't uh, leave any stones unturned and what's the most important with these opening books is that they didn't keep anything for themselves which is not unusual at all, especially when you see an opening book written by a leading grandmaster that uh, they hold back staff to make sure that they can win a couple of more games um, with uh, whatever line or variation they write the book about. If I can name one person whose opening books I would trust 99.9% .9%, I would call it Boris Avruk. I have not seen one book written by that dude on openings that was not top quality work. He's really, really good. But that aside, my Hungarian friend and his Turkish friend, they have done a fantabulous job on this uh, book too, published by New in Chess. And so back to the game that I'm showing you. There is this A3 variation here. Um, it's a very ugly move, but uh, we have to sort of play this because... Um, Knight b4s are very often very annoying moves here. For example, uh, in this position there is a line with knight c6 where we can't take this because knight b4 is a motif hitting both of these guys. And so a3 takes the sting out of all of that nonsense. And now um, we seriously are threatening with e4, e5 and knight c3 and take cover of the d uh, d5 square, which is one of the main ideas of the opening. So knight f6, knight, uh, bishop g5 was played now d5 normally loses to tactics based around knight c3 followed by bishop takes and then we pinch uh the pawn on d5 if you are interested in the theory of that once again grab the book now i'm just going to show you this one variation because it's so stunningly beautiful knight c3 rook d8 and it's an important moment to pause here because now we realize that our army has been fully developed Okay, I could technically put the rook here, but that wouldn't uh, make a difference to the game at all. And so um, it's time to launch an attack. Now, almost exclusively, white in this system, well, I wouldn't say almost exclusively, but the main theme of this opening more often than not is that white is attacking in the center and or on the king's side. In some rare cases, we can strike on the queen side too, but that's not that commonplace. So now... White has got knight h4, a very logical move. We are threatening to jump in there. And I already would like to alert you to a very cool tactical trick that lots of uh, amateur players would miss because of their instinct to retake on pieces instantaneously. On bishop takes g2, knight f5 gains a big fat temple 
for the attack. And if bishop drops back to f8, we are still not obliged to take here. We can take here first, causing serious structural damage. And only then king takes g2. And essentially, we have got a winning position here. So, uh, instead of that, they play g6 to prevent knight f5. And this is where, once again, we step up a level from probably 2000 to more like 22 or 2300 fidei. When your opponent plays a move with the intention of stopping something very obviously, I like to teach my students that check if that actually really does stop it because if not then that would look really good if we could actually still play here because a that means that we are doing something really cool and b that they wasted the move because they actually failed to stop what we were hoping to do and that's exactly what's happening here knight f5 starts to tear the king side apart but it needs to be followed by an absolutely stunningly beautiful sacrifice which is none other than rook d6 the reason why this is such a gorgeous move is because the main purpose of this move is to cut the board half and basically along the D file just restrict the black army entirely so that none of these guys can participate in the defense. So that basically means that white has got one, two, we can count this guy, three, four, with the knight incoming five attackers versus two defenders. That's a really cool scenario. Obviously, takes leads to bishop takes f6, queen f5, something similar to uh, the text. So let's move on. Bishop takes g2. Needless to say that we can't be bothered taking that because our target is the enemy king. So now we are threatening with bishop takes, rook takes. <clears throat> a number of stuff is hanging. So bishop d6 seems to be the safest bet. And now after bishop, uh, bishop takes f6, black is already on the verge of getting mated. Knight c6 is best, queen g5 check, king f8, queen g7 check, uh, king e8 would be one potential variation, but we actually don't have to rush with it because black can't stop this. So best policy again, employ all the army. Okay, so knight b5, really cool move, hitting the bishop, the bishop can't go back here or he can, but that's an important tempo lost. So they played queen b8, rook d1, once again, Bring all the dudes to the party. Very important principle of attacking in chess. Bishop e7. And now we execute uh, the next stage of the attack. When um, we win a uh, queen by 96 check. Bishop g7 is actually not that good. Let me just uh, deal with it in a second. If bishop g7 black simply plays king e7. And we achieve nothing. So 96 check. Queen takes rook takes. Bishop e4. So now if we take stock in this crazy wild variation, uh, we realize that white is still uh, down in material because for the queen, black can show a bishop, a knight and a rook, which is far more than enough. However, the king is in a super duper ticklish spot and it doesn't feel like white's initiative has evaporated. In fact, the remaining white pieces are ridiculously active and clamping down on the whole entire black army. And there are still lots of checkmating motives about, so black has to be really, really careful. And in this position, white actually played a very clever move, queen h8. I love this move. Okay, It is preparing for the uh, upcoming tactics that I don't want to ruin, so I'm not telling you what the main plan is with this. But I would like to show you again that many players would be tempted to try to reduce the material deficit by taking the rook. But that would be such a gross error. I mean... If you compare the power of this bishop to this rook, it's basically incomparable because this bishop guarantees a constantly ongoing raging attack and the rook d8, rook on d8 does absolutely nothing at all. So to take that would be a humongous uh, strategical mistake and a tactical one too. Queen h8, black played rook c8, really black's hands are tied, there is no way really to do anything productive because uh, the rook and the bishop together, they get stop these two pawns and so consequently um, the rest of the army on the queen side is completely isolated from the king and the king side rook c8 and watch the final tactics as it unfolds rook takes c6 a beautiful finishing scenario killing the last defending piece if not they take with the pawn after bishop takes d8 they are going to lose one of their bishops either by taking with the king and then we take the bishop or after rook takes we have this check taking the bishop and winning the game on material. However, this is not the icing on the cake. 
The icing on the cake is that after bishop takes c6, white finishes the game off with a stunningly beautiful bishop e7. This is just gorgeous. I mean, if, if you play a game of chess like this and you end it like this, you feel like you can stop playing chess and you are forever uh, immortal as far as chess is concerned because you have produced something remarkable. It is just such a stunning finale. Uh, if king takes, then the white queen alone delivers a beautiful mate. And if the black cho if black chooses not to take, then they have to play something like this, after which they lose too much material. And the game again is in the pocket for white. If you think that this was entertaining, and if you think that this has got theoretical value to it too, which let me tell you, it certainly does, then a cutting edge gambit against the Queen's Indian by Imrahira and Ufuk Tunser or Tunker is definitely a book for you. Um, super entertaining, very high quality analysis, lots of work into the book. Can't recommend it highly enough. So, yep. Um, that was, guys, another episode of Inside My Chess Library. I hope you liked it, and I will be back with more soon. Thanks for watching.